Okay. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Um, before we get started with the content on personality disorders, we'd like to get to know you. So we are going to pop up a couple poll questions, if you could please take some time to answer those. So poll number one, what is your role? You do see that there is an other option. If you do hit other, if you could please specify your role into the chat box, that would be amazing. Perfect, so we have 3% uh, here, we have pers uh, personal support workers, 26% are nurses, we have 6% occupational therapists, 18% social work, 6% recreation therapist, 12% is PRCs, 6% is administrative, and then we have 24% is other. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, things popping up in the chat. So we have spiritual care, we have a nurse practitioner, clinical educator for senior mental health, uh, geriatric mental health worker, a clinical nurse specialist, pharmacist, dietitian. Wow, we have a really wide range of different specialties here. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll pop out another poll question. How many years of experience do you have working in this field? Okay, so we have zero to five years is 21%. Six to 10 years, we have 23%. Also 23% have 11 to 15 years. 13% has 16 to 20 years. And 21% has 21 plus years. So a large range as well in terms of experience. Amazing. And our final poll question. Have you attended any previous webinars in this series? Okay, 32% say yes and 68% say no. So to our old friends, welcome back. To our new friends, welcome. And hopefully you enjoy um, the webinar that we have for you today. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Perfect, so let's get started. So today we're gonna to be talking about understanding personality disorders. Now this can be um, a topic that creates a lot of conversation. Um, there is this tendency for this subject to stir a lot of emotion in people um, based on you know, some of the content that comes out in terms of discussing personality disorders. So I do wanna say that we encourage that conversation and we encourage uh, you to uh, put your comments and chat, uh, or sorry, questions into the chat. But we do want to let you know that unfortunately we won't have time to do any sort of case-based um you know reconciliation today because we don't have the time but we want you to know that we will uh try to address any of those more broader questions in terms of the that are related to the content at the end of the webinar so our goals for today are to define and classify personality disorders looking at what is personality and what are personality disorders understanding the clusters and the types of personality disorders, looking at treatment and management and engagement strategies, and also looking at a team approach to personal, uh, personality disorder management. And with that, I'm gonna pass it along to Hazel, who's gonna take us through personality and what are personality disorders. So. So um, before we begin the conversation about personality disorders, we would like to spend a couple of minutes talking about what is personality. Personality is the combination of thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Thinking, feeling, and behaving are deeply ingrained patterns what makes a person very unique. What makes you you and what makes, you, makes me me 
is the way a person views, understands, and relates to outside world. Personality is shaped through the interaction of two factors, genes and environment. For example, we describe some people as optimist and some as pessimist based on do they tend to focus on the positives or the negative aspects? Uh, most of the time, it's not once or twice, but most of the time they tend to uh, focus on positives or negatives as optimist and pe pessimist. Do they spend, uh, they, do they tend to be happy or unhappy most of the time? Or do they experience most of the time intense emotions? Do they get angry easily or are they especially sensitive to rejection? Next slide, please. So what is personality disorder? There are fundamental differences in the way people with personality di disorders relate to the world. A person with personality disorder can experience significant problems and limitations in relationships, in their social activities, work, school, and can lead to social isolation or alcohol or drug abuse. The rigid, inflexible, maladaptive emotional and behavioral expressions are seen not just in one interpersonal situation, but it is observed as a pattern throughout the lifespan, throughout the person's life. Service providers need tools to respond to the emotional roller coaster and maintain professional relationship with the person with personality disorders. People with personality disorders have not had the opportunities to learn how to live within a structure or to live with social norms and social rules. Often service providers experience self-doubts and feel inadequate in providing care and helplessness. They feel and experience anger and fear of not doing a good job. If you feel you are in no-win situation with them and feel easily trapped into doing what they want you to do or controlled or manipulated, you are not alone. Your team, your management, others who deal with them may experience similar frustrations. This is how generally most service providers feel while supporting people with personality disorders. A person with personality disorder can misinterpret everything from a conversation and a facial expression. Constructive feedback may be viewed as an assault on the person's intelligence or integrity. So if you say, for example, you made a mistake, they'll interpret as you saying they are stupid. You may say nothing, even then a argument may start. So in most cases, the people do not realize they have a personality disorder because to them, their way of thinking and behaving seems very natural. They tend to blame others for the challenges they face and they are find fault in the things surrounding them. Personality disorders, can significantly disrupt the lives of both the person and the family and people who work with them. They can deplete service providers, staff or service providers or staff's energy in trying to meet their needs. Personality disorders usually begin in the teenage years or early adulthood. <coughs> Sorry. Personality disorders can significantly um, so interrupt everything that you are plan, planning to do. Your care plans may not be always uh, work, working because there is such disruption that comes in between the relationship and the working relationship you have with the people with personality disorders. A diagnosis is made if a person has significant and enduring difficulties in the areas of distorted thinking patterns, problematic emotional responses, over or under-regulated impulse control, and interpersonal difficulties. Next slide, please. There are many types of personality disorders. 
the DSM-5 classifies the 10 personality disorders into three clusters with diagnosable psychiatric conditions. Each is a distinct mental illness defined by personality styles, and people might have mixed symptoms of more than one personality disorder within the same cluster. Under cluster A, we have three types of personality disorders, and they are paranoid, schizoid, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and a schizotypal. In cluster B, we have four personality disorders, and they are antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. In cluster C, we have, again, three personality disorders, avoidant, dependent, obsessive, and compulsive. Now, before we get to treatment and engagement, Sasha will take us through the three clusters in more detail. Thank you, Hazel. So when we look at cluster A, we know that there are the three uh, types. We have uh, cluster A has paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. And what this cluster has in common is that they display um, an odd or eccentric behavior. <clears throat> so for paranoid personality disorder, there's a pattern of distrust and, uh, distrust and suspiciousness such that others' motives and in, are interpreted as malevolent. So they are often uh, concerned that other people are out to harm them in some way, and their motives are always with ill intent. So they have this pervasive distrust, distrust and suspicion, um, and they have this unjustified belief that others are trying to harm or deceive them. They have this unjustified suspicion of the loyalty and trustworthiness of others, and there's a hesitancy to confide in others due to their unreasonable fear that they will use that information against them. So they will, um, you'll notice that they kind of have this uh, angry or hostile reaction to perceived slights or insults, and they tend to hold grudges. Um, they might have this uh, unjustified or recurrent suspicion that a spouse is having an affair or a sexual partner is unfaithful, and it's due to that um, distrust in their relationships. Schizoid personality disorder is a pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of emotional expression. There is a lack of interest in social or personal relationships and they prefer to be alone. There's a limited range of emotional expression, an inability to take pleasure in activities and an inability to pick up normal social cues. Their appearance can be cold or indifferent to others. And this is a lot about these, you know, appearances that we're talking about. Schizotypal personality disorder um, is a pattern of acute discomfort in close relationships, um, cognitive or perceptual distortions and eccentricities of behavior. So sometimes this can come across as more of a peculiar dress a more eccentric way of thinking. Um, their beliefs and their speech might be a little particular. Um, and they have these odd perceptual experiences, such as hearing a voice whisper their name. They have flat emotions or inappropriate emotional responses. And they have a social anxiety and a lack or of or discomfort with close relationships. They may seem indifferent or inappropriate or suspicious in response to other people. And they can tend to have a magical thinking, which is believing that you can influence people and events with your thoughts. Uh, they have this belief that certain casual incidents or events have hidden messages meant only for them. It's important to understand that schizotypal is not the same as schizophrenia. Schizotypal personality disorder is, uh, is defined by, again, this a display of autocentric behavior. In cluster B, we have a presentation that is typically dramatic, emotional, or erratic, and it evokes very strong emotions in other people. When I have worked with people with personality disorders um, in a long-term care setting, I usually uh, have conversations with staff about 
you know, we kind of know the person may have a personality disorder by the way it makes you feel when you're working with them, because they really tend to uh, draw up a lot of like what, what um, Hazel mentioned earlier, a lot of that strong emotion and feelings when we are working with them and it can exhaust and tire some, some of the staff who are working with them. So cluster B has four different personality disorders but under this cluster. The first is the antisocial personality disorder, which is a pattern of disregard for and the violation of the rights of others. This can also be with, um, presented with a disregard for others' needs or feelings, persistent lying, stealing, using of aliases, conning others. They may have recurring problems with the law and repeated violation of rights of others. They can have aggressive or violent behavior. And this is also due to that disregard for the safety of self or other people. Their behavior can be impulsive and they can seem consistently irresponsible and seem to have a lack of remorse. Borderline personality disorder is a pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image and affects um, and affects, sorry, and has market impulsivity. This can include risky behavior, such as having unsafe sex, gambling, or binge eating. They can have a fragile or unstable self-image and can also seem very unstable and intense in terms of their relationships. They have up and down moods, often as a uh, reaction to interpersonal stress, and they can have um, suicidal behavior or threats of self-injury. There is an intense fear of being alone or abandoned, and they have these ongoing feelings of emptiness. So borderline personality disorder, um, again, is kind of that uh, impulsivity is a very marked, um, I guess, behavioral trait in terms of, of this uh, personality disorder. Histrionic personality disorder has a pattern of excessive emotionality and attention seeking. So this could seem like a constant, uh, almost a constant need for attention. Um, they're constantly seeking em emotional, dramatic, uh, or sorry, emotional soothing. They're um, asking people to, you know, be with them often. They don't know how to self-soothe in a way. So they always need somebody to kind of be around to give them that, that sense of support. Um, it also, can, um, they can have excessive emotional or dramatic or sexually provocative behavior to gain some of that attention. So they use sort of um, what we might see as unhealthy, sorry, unhealthy patterns of behavior in order to gain that attention that they're trying to seek. They can have shallow and rapidly changing emotions and excessive concern with their physical appearance. And they think that the relationships that they have are grander and closer and more meaningful than they really are. So they may find that, you know, this person is their best friend and they love them and they're so close, but that person might not feel the same way about that relationship. Um, so they might come off as a little bit clean. Narcissistic personality disorder is a pattern of grandiosity, a need for admiration and a lack of empathy. This is different than the histrionic personality disorder, whereas histrionic, they need that emotionality. It's more about that connection. They really need to have that emotional support, whereas narcissistic personality is a need for admiration. They believe that they're more special or more important um, in others uh, than others. When I think about my experience in a long-term care setting, this could be somebody who believes that you know they should be cared for first, they should have their meal brought out first. Um, they should be, you know, it doesn't matter that there's uh, 24, 30 other people. They are number one. They need that attention. Uh, they have these fantasies about power and success and attractiveness and a failure to recognize that other people have needs and feelings as well. And they have this exaggeration of these achievements or their talents. They can come off as quite arrogant. Um, and they have this expect, expectation that they'll be constantly praised and admired. And because of that, they have this unreasonable expectation for favors and advantages. And they often take advantage of others um, because they believe that other people envy them. 
Finally, moving on to cluster C is the presentation that includes traits of anxiety and fearfulness. This is often one of the more under um, diagnosed personality disorders or, or under noticed, I guess like you could say, because they aren't as emotional provoking in the person who cares for them. They are uh, the avoidant personality disorder. So this is a pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy and hypersensitivity to negative evaluation. The person is just too sensitive for criticism or rejection. They tend to um, take criticism very hard um, and it's almost a self-reflection of, of failure to them. They feel inadequate, inferior or unattractive. And so they have this avoidance of work activities that require interpersonal contact. They try to stay uh, more to themselves and they're socially inhibited, timid and isolated. They avoid new activities. They don't wanna meet people. They more just wanna be on their own. They have extreme shyness in social situations and personal relationships because of this fear of disapproval or disapproval, embarrassment and a, free, a fear of ridicule. Dependent personality disorder is a pattern of submissive and clinging behavior related to an excessive need to be taken care of. Um, again, this is different from histrionic personality disorder where the people need that constant attention. It, the constant attention in histrionic personality disorder is the inability to self-soothe, whereas independent personality disorder, it's more of this need to be physically cared for. So they have an excessive dependence on others and feelings of the of the need to be cared up, cared for. And so they become submissive and kind of clingy um, and they don't really want to care for themselves. And in my again, in my experience, in terms of long term care practice, this can come across as somebody who uh, asks for more help than you know that they need. They might ask you to, you know, um, help bathe them, even though we know that they're able to do that, but they want that, that they want to be cared for. They want for you to take those steps, even though they can do it for themselves. They have a fear of having to provide self-care or fend for themselves. And they have this lack of self-confidence that requires excessive advice and reassurance. There's a difficulty in starting to do projects um, on their own due to the lack of self-confidence. And they also have difficulties uh, with disagreeing with others because of that fear of disapproval. They have, um, they have a tolerance of poor treatment, even when there's other options available and they can speak out for themselves. And again, this is due to that uh, fear of disapproval. They have an urgent need to start a new relationship when a close one has ended. Finally, we uh, have obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and this is a pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and control. Uh, it is that pr uh, preoccupation also with details and rules, and it's extreme perfectionism resulting in dysfunction and distress when perfection is not achieved. There's a desire to be in control of people, tasks, and situations, and the inability to delegate because they need to have that uh, higher control over the project. They have a neglect of friends and enjoyable activities because they have excessive commitment to work on projects or other things that they need to perfect. And then there's an inability to discard broken or worthless objects because they must fix them. They, are, they can seem rigid and stubborn and inflexible. Um, and sometimes they're considered tight or miserly because of how much they have their control over spending, budgeting, projects, and almost every aspect of their life. So we've looked at uh, all of these different clusters, but there is um, kind of a, a commonality when it comes to personality disorders. And that is this underlying uh, maladaptive coping. Um, and this creates these, uh, all of these kind of difficulties in terms of relationships. They can have this uh, overarching anxiety, a higher risk for depression. Um, it's really just this inability to have healthy relationships due to poor coping skills that they've had throughout their lives. And again, when Hazel mentioned that these are things that usually start in early adulthood or even teenage years, um, if we're starting to treat people, especially in their, in their adult, uh, older adult life, we're looking at things that have been in place for years and years and years. So these are some things too that they have, you know, difficulty with trusting people, that difficulty with relationships, um, 
the core of relationship difficulties and disturbances in the sense of self provides the best way of understanding people who seem to fit the personality disorder definition. So it's really that in um, that disrupts that disruption and disturbance of the self. So there are some common um, interactions of, uh, of people with personality disorder, and these are things that you can, might see across the board. The other thing I kind of want to mention is that you very rarely have one person with a specific personality disorder from one of the clusters. They are often mixed uh, presentation and often, you know, you might have uh, some features from cluster A, some features from cluster B. So it's never so cookie cutter as one, you know, you, you have histrionic personality disorder. Uh, often there's a combination. So some of the interactions we might see in terms of working with someone with personality disorder is acting out. So this is expressing feelings by acting out without awareness of the true feelings for behaving in the manner that they do. So it's really that lack of insight that they don't really understand that they're doing something wrong because this is the way that they have lived and coped uh, throughout their life. So they don't really have that insight. There's denial, so they refuse to acknowledge the painful aspects of the reality um, that is apparent to other people who they are associating with. Splitting is turning one staff or group against another in an attempt to get their needs uh, met. So this is where they can um, kind of try to stack people against each other in order to be able to get what they want from whichever side or whichever situation. Um, they keep each person believing they are the best. So when they are splitting, they try to tell one person they're the best and uh, tell them secrets and, and try to keep them on their side. Meanwhile, they're also doing it on the other side as well and pitting them against each other. Devaluation is dealing with emotional conflict or stress by attributing uh, negative qualities for others. So they're devaluing um, other people and, and this often can come into in combination with the splitting attitude. So ideal, um, idealization is dealing with emotional conflict or stress by attributing negative qualities for others. And then finally, help rejecting and complaining. So this is dealing with conflict, stress, and bad news by complaining or making repetitious requests for help. Um, so requests disguise their hidden feelings of anger or blame, and then express, they express them by reject, uh, rejecting the suggestions and the advice that people uh, often provide to help them through it. And then they tend to show how upset they are by asking and then rejecting the help. So they're asking for help, but then they basically, they don't take any of the advice, but then they tend to continue complaining about it or um, you know, expressing their negative feelings surrounding it. And just looking at the prevalence of personality disorder, uh, this was a meta-analysis that was completed in 2020, and it was a global pooled prevalence of personality disorder was 7.8%. So it, this was completed with global data, and it did compare high-income and low-income countries, and the trend was noted for higher prevalence in higher-income countries, but that can also be related to, um, you know, some limitations that you know, in in more, um, sorry, in more higher income countries, they actually have an area of interest and funding to do these kinds of studies. But cluster A was uh, pooled to have a prevalence of 3.8%, and cluster C was actually the highest with 5.0. Even though we may feel like a lot of our personality disorders that we manage fall into cluster B, it's actually the lowest prevalence. And the reason why we feel like they are the ones that we kind of manage most often are because they are the ones that evoke the most emotions in us. And now I will pass it back to Hazel, who will take us through some treatments and engagement strategies. So we'll now discuss treatment and engaging people with personality disorders uh, using some supportive strategies. We have, next slide please. We have uh, listed three types of interventions. The first one is psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is the most effective treatment for personality disorders. 
Psychotherapy, however, may be difficult for an individual with a personality disorder because they may be reluctant to build a trusting relationship with the therapist. CBT and DBT are two effective therapies in supporting individuals with personality disorders. Cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is a typical short-term psychotherapy. It helps people to develop skills and strategies for becoming and staying healthy. DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy that combines strategies like mindfulness, acceptance, and emotion re regulation. The DBT teaches skills to cope with and change unhealthy behaviors. These skills are usually taught in a group setting. The second intervention we have is medications. The goal of treatment is symptom reduction, but not a cure. There is no cure for personality disorders. Medication helps to treat certain symptoms such as depression, anxiety, mood swings. Depending on the type of personality disorder, pharmacological interventions can be targeted at reducing symptoms of impulsivity. Antipsychotics may be used in cases of distorted thinking. Most often, individuals with personality disorders do not trust professionals and will not seek treatment. Sometimes they believe professionals are incompetent to help anyone and also believe the problem lies with others and not with them, so they don't need any treatment. One of the tools that is effective in behavior management is the ABC model. You may be familiar with this one. A stands for antecedents uh, it tr or triggers or reasons for behaviors. You look at what is the unmet need and you look at what's the unmet need expressed with this behavior. And you also consider what is the meaning of the expressed behavior. Focusing on antecedents, helps to identify the problem. And that is the first step in being able to help somebody with their behaviors. B, B is for behavior. So what you are looking at here is how was the unmet need expressed and how is the person trying to meet that unmet need? What was the behavior that occurred and what was observed by the team? C stands for consequences. So we were looking at what happened because of the behavior and how did staff support the person to meet the unmet need. Some of the needs of the people with personality disorders are need for recognition, need for control, need for validation, so on. You may find many others. They need people around even though they do not know how to function in a socially acceptable way. Interventions can aim at addressing the reasons for the behaviors and reducing the environmental triggers. We also need to remember many people with personality disorders lead normal, fulfilling lives when they stick to a treatment plan. Next slide, please. So talking about supportive strategies, we would like to talk about SBAR, which is a good framework to use to help identify concerns and needs. And as you know, S stands for situation, B for background, and A for assessment and recommendations. It's a good communication and assessment tool to support the person. Um, so now while working with people with personality disorders, you know, it shouldn't be a crisis driven model or it should be a, you know, ongoing comprehensive care plan. When we depend on crisis driven model, we are only doing, um, you know, situational, uh, situational uh, interventions, trying to put out the fire. But what we need is a comprehensive treatment plan, ongoing support and which helps to build a trusting relationship with the person. And in crisis time, you are able to connect with the person. If you don't connect on a regular basis, 
it may be harder for us to connect with the person when the person is creating a crisis for himself and others around them. Boundary and limit setting can help to set realistic goals and plans, which is important to support a person living with personality disorders. Setting boundaries help preserve the relationship rather than challenge it. Creating a contract with a person that they have largely contrib contributed to can help with boundary setting. But for a contract to work, persons should understand the contract and the trans um, and the terms the terms and conditions of the of the of the contract needs to be followed by everyone it's, it's just doing the contract and not having a follow up with that contract may not work and also important to enforce the consequences if you had have agreed upon a particular uh, intervention and for example if you say we are able to support you when you are not yelling and if the person starts yelling because they don't have the control emotional regulation is a problem you if you have you need to say okay this is the time i can't continue but i'll be back you when you are when you feel a little better and calmer we could continue this conversation so it is important how we handle the consequences and the contract um, elements that we have um, put in um, written in the contract. You ha also have to know the person probably is not able to always adhere to the contract, but they need your support to that to uh, follow the contract. C using a team approach will assist in managing behaviors and ensuring a consistent approach by all staff members. Because one person uh, is not always working with the person, so team approach is important. And many different professionals work together uh, to support the person. So team approach is crucial. Some of the goals of a team approach include, sometimes maybe you have to alter your own response to the person, modifying the environment, revising the expectations that you have, and continually assessing and updating um, the treatment plan or the intervention plan. Take turns assisting the person to protect staff resiliency and prevent turnout, uh, prevent burnout. Um, yeah, staff turnover also happens a lot in a situation where the person is creating uh, challenges. Communication should be clear and concise and reflect commitment that staff can realistically deliver on. Don't make promises that you can't really keep. Support for the team can include education for staff about personality disorders, about specific treatment plans and practical strategies. Team approach is essential for successfully supporting an individual with personality disorder, recognizing the team for achieving any goals or small or big, we, we need to recognize them. And even sometimes we need to celebrate because it is not easy to achieve goals or achieve um, outcomes that we want uh, when we are working with people with personality disorders. Next slide, please. Supporting a person with personality disorder uh, is not only demanding, but also time consuming. Team approach includes the involvement of all the team members, including the physician and management of the organization. It is so important management is on board with the frontline staff who are taking the day-to-day -day stress and tension of uh, the relationship with the person with, uh, working relationship with the person with personality disorders. Team approach can also prevent splitting that uh, Sasha explained, and it promotes uh, collaboration. Staff meetings and huddles are important to discuss the impact of the person's expressions uh, and keep everyone informed of the changes to care plan and to promote consistency in interventions or approaches used by staff. 
Administration or management involvement can validate the challenges staff are facing and the stress resulting from the challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. Collectively, management and staff must identify ways to reduce tension and conflict. Next slide, please. Identifying uh, and defining the problem will assist in developing targeted intervention. So it is the first step to identify the problem and any of the models that we have talked about, SBAR or ABC model can help you in that. Targeted interventions increases the efficiency of the interventions. Um, comprehensive assessment and gathering information, relevant information is so important and it will help in developing an effective care plan. Recognizing the triggers and processing that what occurred will inform the steps needs to be taken to manage the situation and prevention of future events. Setting realistic and achievable goals will support ongoing teamwork. Updating and modifying care plans is necessary to include knowledge and the experience of, of staff you know, of what works and what doesn't work with the person. The process of modifying care plans may also lead to revising team expectations. Sometimes our expectations may be unrealistic. Many a time, staff may need to reflect on how their own approach contributes to successful interventions. It also helps to altering approaches that do not work. Being mindful of environmental triggers, such as noise, lack of privacy, inconsistent routines, change in staff is necessary um, to reduce some adverse events. Next slide, please. Building trust and, um, uh, and collaborative relationship is the first step to reduce some of the altercations with the person with personality disorders. It is important to realize it is not easy for the person to make a change in his ways or her ways Behaviors you see are the maladaptive ways of coping person has developed over his lifetime. It's their long-standing uh, patterns. It is the only way the person has learned to deal with people in their life. The person may be able to make some changes over time with your support, care, and compassion. So we need to listen to the person, validate the person's experiences and emotional state. Next slide, please. Take the person's experience. We need to take the person's experiences very uh, seriously and keep our lines of communication open. If they perceive that you, we are judgmental, um, we have preconceived notions, or this experience uh, some kind of unflexibility within us, with 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 us, uh, care providers, it may uh, hinder your. Uh, ability to support the person. You need to, you, when you you want to show you are, you care and maintain a non judgmental approach. Stay calm and remain uh, respectful. Engage in open communication as much as possible. Sometimes maybe you have to take control, but res being respectful will will lead to success. Acknowledge both the serious and funny side of things and situations. So have some fun um, and connect with the person, not only with dealing with crisis and their difficulties and tensions, but also having some um, social connectivity is important. Foster trust to allow strong emotions to be freely expressed. Uh, be clear in your communication, be consistent and be reliable because they count on that. They need that to function in the best way they could. Remember aspects of uh, challenging behaviors have survival value for the person, as Sasha has explained it. Um, given their past experience, it is important for them and they continue this um, challenging behaviors because of the survival value that it has for them. Convey encouragement and hope about their capacity to change while validating their emotional experiences. Next slide, please. It is important to take care of yourself, find your own support and build a supportive network at work as well as outside of work. 
If you are pulled into the dynamics, dynamics and get into struggle, it will become more difficult for you to, um, for you and worse for the person that you are supporting. So, person with personality disorder is most often not able to regu regulate his emotions. So it's it falls on you to regulate his emotions. So it falls on you to manage your own reactions to the situation. Sometimes you may have to take change. Sometimes you may have to take charge and manage the situation. If the situation is getting out of control, you may have to take whatever action necessary to protect the person from harm to himself or to others. If you feel you're no longer able to maintain a therapeutic working relationship with the person, and it is interfering with your work and it's affecting your well being, you may have to decide to discontinue your working relationship and ask for a different assignment. It is healthy for you and for the person to start working with another person. So it is, it is never easy, and you are your best resource to know when it is time for time for you to uh, um, continue or time for you to discontinue the working relationship with the person. Next slide, please. So we need to recognize people with PD, or personality disorders, do not follow the same social re social rules as a healthy person. There's a lot we do not know about personality disorders, lack of knowledge, not having any easy answers or quick fixes and lack of skills make us feel vulnerable in very difficult situations. So it is critical you work as a cohesive team supporting each other and learning from each other. Most importantly, remember the goal is symptom reduction and environment management and not a cure. Thank you. And now, Sasha, and I'll respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll stop sharing here. We have some time for questions from the chat box. Feel, please feel free to type questions into the chat box, but change the to selection from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the question. I'll start us off with one. Um, Hazel and Sasha, is it necessary to have a diagnosis of personality disorder to be able to build an effective behavioral management plan? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Hazel. No, I, I was saying go ahead, Sasha. We'll oh. start. <laughs> okay. Sorry. okay, thank you. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, it's a great question because uh, I feel a lot of the time in my experience, people do get caught up in terms of this need for a diagnosis. Um, one thing for, for me, I do work with the geriatric population a lot. Um, and if you look at what the criteria is in order to diagnose someone with personality disorders, you have to have a lot of that collateral history information. So we need to know that, you know, um, has this been a pattern for a really long time? Um, and has this something that started in, you know, early adolescence and teenage years or in early adulthood? So, um, Sometimes we don't have that information and we don't have people who are good historians, if, especially if they also have a dementia. So we need to be able to understand that it's not necessary to have a diagnosis really because it doesn't really change anything. Um, we're treating symptoms. And so if we don't have the diagnosis, the, in order to treat the behavior that we're seeing, we would use the same strategies, whether there's a like a formal diagnosis or there's not. Do you want to add anything to that, Hazel? Yeah, I was just thinking when you're talking about it, uh, Sasha, that sometimes maybe when we are working with older people and we see some similar characteristics, we may be thinking, oh, this is a personality disorder. But Dr. Tao, Michael Tao, with whom I we work, uh, geriatric psychiatrist from St. Mike's, he tells us uh, not to conclude quickly and decide there is a personality disorder, but he suggests we uh, dig deeper, um, and, and explore further because at times um, with the changes in the brain, cognitive changes, as well as maybe untreated depression, uh, you may see some resemblance of uh, characteristics. 
but he says those are the ones we may be able to, depression could be treated and um, the person may be able to function differently. The other part of it is if the key part is if these are not lifelong ingrained uh, characteristics, it is definitely not a personality disorder. And uh, as Sasha said, uh, having a diagnosis doesn't make a difference. And I know uh, working with the team that I'm working with, uh, doc, psych, geriatric psychiatrists now shy away from diagnosing because that gives a tunnel vision and that makes us sometimes maybe more prescriptive in our approach rather than being flexible and eclectic and trying to uh, see what works with the person. Great, thank you. Um, I have a, a great question here. As the person ages, does the behavior, for example, angry outbursts or paranoia get worse? How do you know if the person is beginning to have dementia as these can also be symptoms? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the first part sure. of the question? As a person be, <laughs> ages, that's the behavior. I guess the behaviors that were brought up, the angry outbursts, the paranoia, do they get worse? Mm -hmm. And then there's a second part to that question. How do you know if the person is beginning to have dementia, as these okay. can also be symptoms of dementia as well? Okay. So sorry. Wanna, yeah. My, Sasha, do you want to say something? Uh, I was just going to mention about the um, the original, like the the part of the original question, does the behavior get worse? Um, I think that, um, I don't know if it necessarily gets worse. It might get, um, it might become more uh, easier, if that makes sense. So be, personality disorders, a, a way that I like to describe it, although there's really not a very good working or operational definition in any of the studies and research that I looked at, but um, personality disorder is, is basically a a maladaptive coping. So somebody has, uh, since adolescence, since teenage years, since their early adulthood, they've ingrained this way of coping with stressors, depending on what that is, um, into their way of dealing with life and they're dealing with relationships and they're dealing with, um, um, you know, emotions and people. So as it's almost like a practiced ritual in a way. So when they're dealing with something, maybe they can't self-soothe, they don't know how to cope with uh, emotional stressors. So they utilize people in their environment in order to satisfy that. And I think that with time, once they they realize that this is something that, although it's maladaptive, it works for them, it makes them feel better, um, that, that it becomes easier for them to do it. So it just becomes more part of their routine and it becomes a little bit more uh fluid, I guess, in a way for them to kind of perform these different uh, techniques. And I'll, I'll pass it on to Hazel to kind of add anything else to that. Just a couple of things I can add to that. Uh, you have explained it nicely. Uh, one thing we know, the personality disorders mellow down a bit with the, um, uh, as they're aging because their physical abilities are also diminishing and they are becoming more and more dependent. But one thing we also know because they are patterns, they have these patterns, they have as their habitual patterns as uh, Sasha has mentioned, there may be this chronic anger, chronic dissatisfaction, no matter what you do. But what you may also be able to do is when you get to know the person very well, you, you are able to see through that. This is not something you uh, evoked in them, you triggered. This, this is the way they are, they're operating. You may be able to see be, behind the scene how you can connect with the person, how you can meet their need, whatever the need that they're expressing and um, continue to establish and develop a working relationship with them. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. When a client has been triggered and you're providing support by validating their emotional state, what therapeutic framework is guiding your approach? I usually use the GPA validation that is um, uh, expanded by GPA. That is first, um, in any supportive strategies, we need to validate what the person's emotional uh, state is, whatever they are experiencing. And one thing you would see when you're validating, you are connecting with the person and you're helping the person to calm down rather than escalate further. So once you um, uh, recognize and respond, 
Uh, it looks like it's a real difficult time for you. I'm so sorry it's upsetting you. Um, whatever it is that you're seeing, you may want to say, um, you know, for example, if somebody is um, always coming up with problems for you to solve, you may want to say, how would you like to resolve your concern? You know, I would like to support you. And how would you like it to be uh, resolved? Because if you try to give them solutions, they may always have yes, but no, that doesn't work. Or they may find ways to uh, unintendedly uh, defeat whatever plan is coming up. So involving them, uh, getting them to participate in problem solving would be helpful. I'm not sure I answered the question. Uh, Sasha, do you want to add to that? No, I think that's, 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 that's great. Thank you. Saying I'm sorry, um, I do not know how I could help you is also a good response because we don't have always this magical answers for them. And saying sorry doesn't mean that you're sorry that you made them upset. What you're saying is I'm sorry to see you being so upset. So validation, um, I would use all the four steps that GPA uh, mentions in how to validate a person and how to uh, then help the person to recover or get unstuck from wherever they are stuck. Thank you, Hazel. Um, we have lots of questions in the chat box, but I'm mindful of the time as well. It's 1029. Um, and I believe there was a, somebody who had asked a question about vaccination and uh, Kay, Sasha did respond to your question in the chat. So you can look at that. Um, there are so many wonderful, great questions in the chat box and I apologize that we don't have time to get to them. Um, but I, um, when you do get the slides that we send out, there are resources that are attached to the PowerPoint that we created in terms of some more information. Um, and where we got a lot of our, uh, the most recent research that we got some of these, uh, this information from. So hopefully that is helpful as well. And I also would suggest that to you access your team members like uh, PRCs, um, GMOD clinicians, BSOT. You have so, many, so much support. I, I'm, I'm talking about Toronto. Um, so look for your uh, resources that are available in your community to support you because it's not easy work working with people uh, who express uh, themselves and have personality disorders. I think a copy of the presentation will be provided to all participants. Yeah. There are a lot of questions about that. So you can, you're, you can feel free to share with your staff as well. And also a copy of the webinar will be posted on the YouTube website for RGP. Thank you all Thank so much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you.